How you doing, man? I'm okay. How are you? Good, good. Good to see you. Anyone else? We want to welcome our new. What's your name? Hello, Josh. Josh. Good to have you with us, Josh. And I see a couple other faces that I hadn't had a chance to really sit down and uh, get to know yet. Uh, we'll get to it. So, John, can we grab my board? Continue our time together in the Word and just worship, and it's good to uh, it's good to be back. Back. Uh, it's mixed. It's mixed emotions, I guess, because uh, you know I enjoy uh, my time with family and uh, a couple days away um, in Alabama. And still, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's good. You get to see John. Yeah, I saw John. How's, how's he doing? He's doing good. He's going to be here in a couple weeks. Okay. He wanted to come by and, uh, and see you guys. He asks about you guys and uh, prays for you all. And uh, I tell him the same way. So that you guys ask about him. He's doing really good. Good. So I got to go to church uh, with him Sunday morning. And it was, man, it was a good time of worship. And uh, it was a good time of the Word. So well, let me pray for us. And then I just want to share with you some things from God's Word. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for uh, another day. God, we thank you for life and uh, for your Spirit. Thank you for uh, how you fill us with your Spirit, how you instruct us, teach us, guide us, convict us, correct us. Thank you for your comfort. Lord, we pray that even right now, God, you would search our hearts, cleanse us, Lord, fill us with your spirit. God, I pray that you would lead our time together in your word. And uh, just thank you for the opportunity to open up your word as a group and, and hear, really hear from you what you would have us to hear and to obey. Help us to do this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2. And it's been probably a few weeks since we have um, been on our subject of prayer and revival. And so I want to continue that this morning uh, as we've spent uh, a number of months talking about revival. Uh, remember, we've looked at revival from an Old Testament perspective. Uh, we defined it from an Old Testament Hebrew perspective. What does it mean to be revived, refreshed, renewed, made alive? And, and so we looked in depth at examples of revivals in the Old Testament. And then we turned our attention to the New Testament and looked at it uh, from a New Testament perspective, definition, and we've really found that it's not all that different uh, than the Old Testament definitions and usages. Uh, there are many usages to the word, to that terminology, the phrasing of being revived. What does that mean? What does that look like? So I want to give you, uh, and of course when we looked at it from the Old Testament perspective, as I mentioned, uh, we're looking at it from a uh, Hebrew cultural perspective. Uh, Perspective when we turn to the New Testament, uh, the, it is, which is more Greek influenced, it's written in Greek, so we have to look at it as a defining what does it mean to be uh, revived. So I want to give you just a couple of those, just as a reminder, since it's been several weeks since we've talked about uh, revival. And, and before I give you those definitions, I, I want to remind you that. Uh, hopefully we're, we're doing more than just talking about revival. We, we want to be revived by the Spirit of God. Be refreshed, Amen. renewed, filled by Him. Uh, he's the one that does that. Uh, but we have a, a part to play in that. Our response to His Spirit. Our response to His Word. Our humility. Our prayer. Our confession. our devotion to one another, all of that has an effect on the, um, on how
how we experience God, how we'll experience His reviving power. So I just want to give you that as a reminder um, that whenever we come together, uh, our goal is not just to simply learn more stuff about God or just learn um, some facts, learn how to outline, or even learn how to study God's Word. Those are good things. Um, we should know how to study God's Word. I give you guys a lot of principles and kind of some how-to and some mechanics on how to study God's Word. We should know how to do that. But the goal isn't just to learn the Bible or learn some stories or learn some principle and learn how to study. The goal is life change. That's, that's God's goal for us. His goal for us is holiness. His goal for us is to be like Him and to be changed. And He does that as He changes our heart. Um, again, we have a part in that in our surrender to His work. So having said that, sort of a kind of an introduction back into our topic. When we look at the New Testament and we look at this, um, this element of reviving, this phenomenon, or, or however you want to put it, of being revived, there's a couple of different words that are used. Uh, and depending on its usage, just like in the Old Testament, depending on how the word's used and in what context, what situation, what's going on in that scene, it's, it's based on that that you know how uh, to define that particular word, whether it is um, we're looking at revival as in someone that's being revived, that was alive, they're dead, and now they're alive again, being revived, right? So that image isn't hard for us to understand, right? Uh, there is the sense of reviving as being uh, refreshed. Uh, there is the sense of reviving. I, I usually give the illustration as I look out there at those fields and when it gets in the middle of summer and, and, and it had rain, of course it's been raining plenty here where the ground the grounds are nice and green, but whenever we go without the rain and it gets brown and just too far, and then that there's life in the roots, there's life in there, uh, but it does it looks dead, right? And then you get those rains, those summer rains that will revive and refresh and make new again. So those are all the various usages that we find in the scriptures when we look at revival, being uh, renewed. Uh, the one that I mentioned, uh, sometimes when you see this word or this concept in the New Testament, it literally means to be resurrected. I'm looking at a definition here. Uh, it comes out of the prodigal son story, the account. Uh, <laughs> or par parable, rather, that Jesus gave. He talked about the prodigal son, goes off to a far country and, and, and squanders his inheritance, and he comes back to his father, and his father says, in Luke 15, 24, he says, my son was dead, and now he's alive again. He lives again. That word is where we get, uh, is, is where we get this reviving idea and of, of being resurrected. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. In other usages, it might mean to spring into life. Uh, Romans 7, 9 uh, is, is the reference for that. We won't take the time to look at that as we've looked at that before. Here's a quote. I've given you this a couple of times, but again, it's good to review for those of you that had not been with us for the last few months. And, and since it's been a few weeks, I want to give you this quote again. That this term, uh, as we see in those two instances, the term, or at least in that first instance, here's what uh, one commentator says about it. The term is vital with the creative energy of God. The creative energy of God. The healing, redemptive, resurrection life of Christ. So there's... It's, it's important when we define these words because then you get that depth of meaning that we don't always get in just our English language. And when we just read the word, we can get a lot from it because it's not that foreign to our minds. But when you understand those usages and the depth of meaning, it just the richness of, of what's 
here really comes out. And, and through that, the richness of, of the Holy Spirit, how He uses His Word, and, and when we realize that it's through the Holy Spirit that where, where life comes, uh, where, the, where the Spirit gives life, right? And that is, uh, of course, life in Christ, ultimately. So, it also is in reference to uh, the renewing, uh, recreative power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when we look at the Word, when we find this Word or this concept in Scripture, it means to stir or kindle up as a fire. We've looked at this also, 2 Timothy 1.6, if you want to jot that down and look at it later. But it's where Paul encourages Timothy to stir up the gift of God which is in thee. Uh, in, the, in the wording, in the language there, it literally means to stir into flame. So as we've looked at, one of the things that we've looked at is we've looked at examples of revival whether they're modern examples, whether they're Old Testament examples, or whether they're New Testament examples, we find certain characteristics that are consistent in all of them, right? Uh, I've mentioned a few of those already this morning, uh, but just to get, just to see if you're awake and you're with me, let's do a little bit of that, just a little review still, for what are those characteristics that we find that are consistent, that are almost In, in some of these characteristics, if not all of them, they're even necessary, critical for revival to take place. What are those characteristics? Prayer. All right, prayer was was huge. Prayer was one. Let's go ahead and jot them up here. Just Testimony. Yep. Yeah. Submission. Submit. I'm feeling green this morning. Uh, prayer. Testimony. What else? Submission. All right. Submission. Repentance. <coughs> Obedience. Repentance. Obedience. Confession. Yeah, confession. What else? There's, there's still probably a couple more that we haven't mentioned here. These are, these, you see how these would be critical to experiencing God. Uh, take and when I'm doing when I'm doing a study or I'm meditating on God's word and I'm considering some uh, either a commandment, instruction. One of the things that I'll do a lot of times is I'll think, what does it look like if I don't do that? Like, what does a life look like if, if I don't do this, if I don't follow this? So I look at the opposite of that and take that with, with these and go, man, can we really experience God or experience even His reviving, refreshing, renewing power without prayer? Right? That's what I mean by this is critical. These are essential characteristics. Uh, testimony. Having a personal testimony for one, but also sharing that uh, submission, surrender. What is the opposite of that? What would you know? A rebellion. 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 I mean, the person that is a rebellious uh, has a rebellious spirit. I was reading in, um, I think it was Psalm sixty-six that talks about uh, for the rebellious. That, that it's as though the, the sky is like a bronze shield, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning, man, the communication yeah. and, and, and getting prayers lifted up to God and Him being able to act on our behalf, it's like there is something in the way when we have a rebellious heart, right? Um, so repentance, you know, without repentance... Without obedience, without confession, if we wonder, so I'll also I'll also do this little exercise here with God's word, with studying God's word, with uh, considering His instruction. 
What if what if I'm not really trusting him? What if I'm not believing him? What if I'm uh let me put it this way. When we're not experiencing God in a way that God has for us, in a way that we know that we should be, when we're not experiencing His, His joy, hey ladies, how are y'all doing? Good to have y'all with us this morning. When we're not experiencing His, His joy, when we're not experiencing His peace, Settle down. It's okay, Mary. It's, it's, it'll be fine. It's good. It's good to have y'all with us. It's always good to have the women, the women with us. When we're not experiencing God in a way that we know that His Word says that we should be, or we see in others, we see a peace or a joy. That's cause for reflection. And I'm sure you guys do this. I do this. I start asking the question like, man, why don't, why am I not experiencing this, this, this peace right now or, or his joy in, in this season or in these moments or where it becomes a question of like this internal deep question of, man, what is happening in my heart? Is there, is there sin? Right? That's where you turn that into prayer and you're praying things like, God, search my heart and pray the Psalms where, where the psalmist says, search my heart and see if there is any wicked way in me. That's a good place to start to say, to see why am I not experiencing God in a way that He wants for us to experience Him, right? Oh, I was just going to say that that's an important thing when you say uh, search me. Yeah. Instead of just looking at Oh, how filthy I am! Right. Like, and just dwell on that. Yeah, it's a different thing, right? You know? Yeah, search me, oh God. See if there's any wicked way. Me, there's this question of God. Show me, show me me. Show me my sin. There's the there's the question. This internal reflection of where we ask things like God. Show me where I'm not believing you. God, show me where I'm not trusting you. I mean, He hears those prayers because He wants to reveal Himself to us. I mean, He's done everything to reveal Himself to us. I mean, from the person of Jesus Christ to His Word, I mean, He to giving His Spirit, He has done everything to get to us. He's not, he's not dodging us and, and, and avoiding us. He, he wants to be found Because ultimately, He's the one that came looking for us. Right? He's the ultimate seeker. He came looking for us. I think about Scripture when I, when I think about these kind of reflections. I think about the passages that talk about um, God revealing Himself to those uh, whose heart is committed to Him. Right? Psalms. Yeah? Psalms 37? Right? I think about the New Testament where Jesus says, the pure in spirit are blessed for they shall see God. You wonder why you don't see God? I, I mean, there's times where we do. I'm not... There's times where I wonder, why am I not experiencing God? What, what, is, what's, what is wrong, right? Is there some impurity? <coughs> and then after you've gone through that exercise, I, I talk to uh, a, a lot of you, and we get into these one-on-one -on -one conversations, and it may be, uh, you know, you're just looking for an answer to some question you had from what's going on or from the Word or there's some situation or conflict. Or... And I'll say, you know, really there's there's two questions. A friend of mine uh, shared this with me. Uh, 
probably within the last year. I was sharing some struggles with him and just like, man, just going through it. And man, just dealing with these questions that we're talking about, the struggles. And he said, Matt, there's, there's two questions really to ask of God in, in that struggle, in that difficult situation, in that problem, in that difficult relationship or scene. <coughs> And one I've already shared with you. It's, it's God, show me me. Show me my sin. And, and let's suppose that he, he does, He shows you areas uh, or an area that needs to be confessed. Which means to agree. Confess means I agree. It means we agree with God. When He shows us, here is what doesn't look like Jesus and we confess our sin, we agree with Him, we accept His forgiveness, and, and we're clean, right? So, there's the question of, God, show me me. Show me my sin. And, and so there's that process of like, okay, I, I'm clean. I'm, my, my conscience is clear. I, I, as far as I know, I, I haven't offended anybody. And, but there's still this like, really difficult life or problem or season. So the second question is, God, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to teach me? Those are, those are, those are good questions to ask. Those are questions that God wants to answer. He does answer. Amen. Let this be fuel for thought and fuel even for your prayer life. So hopefully, um, you know, we're learning to pray in that way. I know there's been a couple of hands up. Um, Jeremiah, do you have a, something to add to this or a comment or a question? What about uh, forgiveness? Yeah, forgiveness. Um, certainly, why don't you explain? Why would that be? Why would that be important in experiencing God? Because, like, if we walk around with unforgiveness, yeah. then God the Father can't forgive us. Yeah, yeah. That's part of that block. Yeah, that's part of the block. Yeah. Mm. You know, yeah. With unforgiveness, I believe he can't even much hear our prayers, right? Right. right. It's definitely a, a hindrance. Yeah. If not a block altogether. Nate? Application is a big one as well. Application? What do you mean by that? Like, we're, uh, there are Bible time typically being Southern Baptist revivals where you know, speakers come in and we're you know, asked to search our hearts and, and kind of rededicate, refocus on God. Yeah. Uh, but I feel like it's not just about, I feel like it's about soaking it in and then also applying it to the world, applying God's Word and moving on God's Word and not just harboring it in our heart but to share it with others. Yeah, acting on it. You know, I, I usually, uh, I'll get you lying in a second, I usually, um, Put it this way, along those lines. Anytime we open God's Word, hear it preached, study it, read it, there's a response that's called for. Right? Some some action step. What God, what what am I to do with this? What am I to believe? Is there a behavior that needs uh, correcting? Is there a belief that needs adopting? Is there um, a promise that that needs holding on to and, and claiming and, and believing even in that? Uh, there's a response. Part of that is, I think, what Nathan is saying, that the application of, and that's what I was talking about earlier on, that we're not just coming together just to learn more stuff about God, learn how to study His Word. Those are that's 
that's great, and that's part of the process. Um, but this is where James talks about uh, being doers of the word and not just hearers only, right? Putting it into practice, application. Body. Uh, everyone needs to be on one accord in unity. Yes. Yes. Yep. Good job, Mom. Yeah, good one. So, um, unity, so still looking at those essential to catch the uh, women up on uh, our subject of prayer revival. Many of you have been with us through this course. It's been a few weeks since we uh, talked about revival or, or considered the, these characteristics. And I know we've, we've done this a number of times, but it's, it's helpful uh, because I, I believe that God may and will use any part of this for us to consider where we're at in any one of these characteristics, right? So, unity. Somebody, oh. Faith. Hey. Yes. Okay, good. So, I mean, really, some of these, I don't, we, we've done this exercise before, and, um, The list always looks pretty much like this, but sometimes something will come out where it's like we haven't, this seems so obvious. I think it seems so obvious that I'm not sure if we've had it on the list before whenever we've done one of these sessions. And, and maybe we have, but man, faith. So then look at, do that same exercise and consider, well, what does a life without faith look like, right? How is God going to act on behalf of, of uh, his word and his people uh, uh, on behalf of your situation when there is no faith. Think, think about where uh, the gospel writer says that uh, because of, of their unbelief of Jesus, he was unable to do many miracles there, right? Speaking of that home, his, his hometown there. Now, right? James. Deliverance. So as we, as we think about this, so when we think about deliverance, right, not so much, I'll go ahead and put it up here, but it's not so much, so we could do a whole nother session and talk about the results of his reviving, his refreshing, his renewing, the rekindling that comes through his spirit, and then our part to, uh, to take part in that, to experience Him in that way, then what are the results? Freedom. Yeah, right. So let's, let's consider any more, let's stay on track though, any more characteristics or essentials that without which we should not expect to experience God's reviving power, Maria. Um, yeah. Okay, persistence, right? Yeah. Good. James? Love. Yeah? Sure. Unity. I got unity up there. Yeah. Yeah, I got unity up there. So, all right, so we're tracking. You guys are with me. Uh, yeah, faith, trust. Essentials of man, what 
What lines our hearts up with Him in such a way that we can experience His renewing, reviving power uh, that let, let Acts 2, as one commentator put it, let Acts 2 be our model, right? So there's probably one or two here that I want to point out. Did you, did you have something else? And worship. Worship? Yeah. Okay. Good. Worship. So it's our attention is focused on God. Uh, we've talked about this before. And I think we're going to see this element again uh, in, in, in just a few moments. But a sense of expectancy. Expectancy. What do I mean by expectancy? Expecting the Spirit to show up. Right. Yeah, expecting for God to move. Expecting for the Spirit to, to show up. And confidence. confidence. It's, a, it's a confidence in God. I tell you, your experience of of God is will be directly related to every one of these. And this sense of expectancy is no less. It's almost like trusting in Him. Right. It is very much tied to back to this uh, trust and faith. But it's it's a, it's this heart that is much different than one that's just going through the motions. Right? We've all done that. We all get caught up in that, going through the motions. I mean, I, I the, the the tendency to slip into that is there for every one of us to uh, to get into this law. Just the kind of uh, status quo. You know, we're 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 still doing the things right that it is involved in our faith, but. They get too comfortable. Comfortable, maybe the passion. So then there's that need for it, where we're praying, God revive us, right? That's yeah. this that's from the perspective of, of a believer, a child of God that's saying, God, I don't want to go through the motions. I, I want to experience your reviving spirit, God. Revive us. Genius? Yes, man. Uh, it's in the sense of, of openness. Yeah. Openness is, is both uh, uh, a, sense of, a change of heart. Yeah. Where we, our desire, our passion, yeah. becomes God's passion. Right. Where we feel and want what He wants. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Genius. So, brokenness, uh, we might. Uh, we talk about humility. The scripture calls that a contrite spirit, a humble spirit, lowly. Going back to the Beatitudes, where where Jesus talks about the the uh, the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit are blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Is that for they should be called the children of God? James, there's the kingdom of heaven. I'm gonna Thank say, you. We all have to be careful of um, having a relationship before responsibility in a way. Because, like, yes. Jesus didn't send Good. out the disciples. You know, we see that, like, going all the world. But that yeah. was three years of yeah. being with Jesus. Right. Not to say we shouldn't do our duty. <laughs> yeah. But we, sh we shouldn't try to do it on our own because that's right. self righteousness and. You know, and in the end of the day, we're we're trying to, you know, we're trying to get things done yeah. in our flesh again. Right. Relationship yeah. before responsibility. Man, I, I, that might show up in a sermon title. <laughs> <laughs> I might steal that. No. Um, I, I heard. Um, I think it was. It might have been John MacArthur that talks about that, where he's, he talks about a lot of, um, and it may not have been him, but he talks about a lot of believers that 
have all the right knowledge. And this is what I was just talking about earlier. I got to take this now. Where we talk about that we're not just coming together to just learn more stuff about him. And whether it's him or someone else, they talked about, you know, you, you have a, a theology that's a mile wide, but only an inch deep. That has to do with what you're talking about yeah. when we talk about relationship before responsibility. As what Nathan's talking about, he talks about application, the doing, putting theology into practice. We do a lot of the work of theology. Who is God? What is He like? How can we know Him? What do we believe about the Bible? And, and, and what do we believe about Jesus and, 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 and doctrine? And, but it's in order that we would put it into practice and, and, and step out in faith into those situations and act on it, right? Where we're getting out of the boat and walking on water. <laughs> right? All right. Let me, uh, let me move on uh, from here. Jamie, real quick, what you had one to go with this or a... Absolutely. Tender heart, sensitivity to the spirit. Uh, absolutely essential for experiencing God. All right. Hopefully you're still in Acts 2. Uh, and we have just a little bit of time left. And so, in fact, you know, I think the last time we were going to look at Acts 2, and we did one of the... Uh, <laughs> From memory, this because it's been several weeks ago, we talked about one aspect uh, that's found in verse two, and I don't know that we got much past that. So we kind of we've done this again, uh, but this has been worth our time. Uh, it's been <coughs> worth it for me, just a good reminder. But let's look at instead of reading, we need a little bit of context. Uh, to, to step into this scene, to step into the environment of what's happening here. Uh, so let me just kind of do that, fill that in. So this is after the resurrection of Christ, right? Jesus has ministered for uh, three some odd years with the disciples. He uh, was crucified, was raised from the dead. He, he told his disciples to, to go and to wait for him. And, and he, and he uh, appears to them in Galilee. Uh, and then he ascends to the Father. And then, uh, so Acts, what Acts does is record for us the beginnings of the church uh, after the resurrection. And so there is just a very brief context for you for the uh, for the book of Acts, the beginning of Acts. And so the disciples, they're gathered in, in the upper room there uh, in Jerusalem. We see that in Acts 1, verse 12. This is after the ascension. They return to Jerusalem from the mount uh, called Olivet, uh, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they entered the city, they went up to the upper room where where they were staying. That is Peter and John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew. Right, so it goes on, lists the names. Verse 14 gives us one of the essential <coughs> characteristics for revival. Let's look at that. These all, with one man, with one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So there's actually, um, there's at least, one, well, there's, there's a couple of essentials in there. And they would be uh, one that we've already mentioned. Uh, the resource that I took this list from here uh, came out of an um, a, a internet uh, resource as far as the, the way that they phrased it, the revival Dot com or something along those lines. They put it this way, prepared for. So revival is prepared for by consecration. That's a big word we have to define. <coughs> Prepare.
prepared for by <laughs> consecration. My brain's just working really weird this morning. And prayer. Prayer. So you get two for one on that one. I skipped one because um, we've already talked about this. It bears mentioning uh, in... Let's come back to this. Let me give you the first one. We spent a whole session on this. Uh, look at verse 2, chapter 2. So we're going to be jumping around. All of these kind of uh, come from the different verses right in this same area. Look at Acts 2, verse 2. It says, And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. All right, so this is on the day of Pentecost. Um, this would have been 50 days after Passover uh, was, was a festival, a feast day uh, called uh, the day of Pentecost. So it was on this day, they're gathered in this upper room, and suddenly there came a, from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. So what is... This? this is that part of revival where I ask the question, and we've done this before, where we say, where does revival come from? Where does revival come from? Uh, it comes from God, Spirit. right? Yeah. It doesn't come from... Uh, Nathan mentioned, uh, you know, where... Like we have these events that we call revival where there's powerful preaching and there's prayer, there's some of those elements, a time set aside, right, where everybody's prepared themselves, hopefully, for hearing God's Word, and, and, but it's something that we schedule and we call it revival, but ultimately revival has to come from God. And so this source uh, here, I think, puts it really well that your revival is initiated by the Spirit. <clears throat> or you could say initiated by God. It's initiated by the Spirit. And we see that in uh, verse 2. Chapter 2, verse 2. In fact, um, when we look at verse 14, we see the disciples, and so we see them preparing themselves by consecration. Simply just means to set themselves apart, right? For, for a special activity, special service. Uh, this word uh, anointing is often used. And you might wonder, well, what does it mean to be anointed or consecrated? It means to set, up, set apart for a special use, to, re, to be regarded as holy unto God, set apart. <coughs> um, already, we can pull principles out of that and go, man, this is, we're supposed to, we're set apart. Scripture talks about us as New Testament believers as being set apart set apart for service, set apart for God's special possession, set apart to be holy, set apart to not be like and look like and talk like and act like the world, but to be a peculiar people set apart for God. We see the disciples looking back at, at verse uh, 14 where they are setting themselves apart, they're consecrated, they're, they're and through prayer. But there is also, we don't, we don't necessarily see, we don't necessarily see it mentioned here where they're expecting, but there is a sense of expectancy, right? So that's kind of implied in there. All right. Prepared for by consecration and prayer. Uh, look back at verse 2. Uh, there is a suddenness we might have talked about this one before. A suddenness. Uh, 
a surprising suddenness of his presence. Man, you can't, you can't, you just, you can't manipulate this. I mean, if, if we, I know, I know we've talked about this before because we, we'll do this with worship a lot of times. If we're not careful, we're trying to manufacture this feeling and this, this presence of God. We just have to be really careful with that, right? Uh, there are those that study, you know, the right lighting and the right sound and the right key. <clears throat> I'm not saying, though, that we don't create an environment, right? I think there's a, there's, a, there's a place for that, to do things well and do things right. And, and, and man, we've come to worship God. And, and, and we might turn the lights down and, and, and we might have just the right key and, and the right song picked out. But that's not the focus. The feeling is not the focus. The song, the, the emotion, God uses that and it, and it may be part of it, but He's the focus. It's, wor it's about worship. It's about Him. I'm, I'm sure and hope that many of you, if not all of you, have sometime experienced or, or you will experience this just this presence of God moment. I'm sure if you're a believer, you've experienced it. <laughs> uh, if it was just in that initial understanding of your sins being forgiven, right? And then you have these moments where it's like you just want to stay there. I can think of a, a handful of times. I, I can think of a couple of really significant moments where I was just overwhelmed with God's presence. I mean, just... It might have been a song that triggered, that, that, that played a part in that, but then there was the truth that was carried through that song of like an awareness of God's love, right? And there would be this sense of just suddenness of like, man. Sometimes we use the language of, man, God just showed up today. God, we just, we just really just felt His presence today. Now, Theologically, we know that God's always with us, right? God is, is with us. God's promised to never leave us nor forsake us, so we know that, that He's always with us. And then you have these moments of where He just makes Himself known in such a way where it's like, you know He's with you, right? Mm -hmm. that's, a good, that's a good day. Mm -hmm. All right, so skip down to, um, in the order of this, to put these in a better order, so I apologize for the kind of randomness. Look, skip down to verse 43. Man, we have skipped way down. We, we just cut out. There's some homework. Go back and read Acts 2. Read Acts 1 and 2. Uh, and and, and let's, uh, let's talk about it again. Uh, Acts 2, verse 43. We find a, another... This, is, this would be more of a result. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. An awesome God conscience. An awesome God... That's not the right word. Conscientiousness. That's a tough one. I'm, I'm not even... Not even sure. Not sure. Right. An awesome God conscientiousness. Here's what that means. I've kind of already talked about that. When this happens, we talk about God showing up, you know it's happened. There's no question. There is this awareness of His presence that you don't want to say or do or think anything that would offend Him, right? Because with that comes this awareness of His holiness. Man, that is, that is a good and godly and biblical experience.
experience of God that when, when we experience God, we say that God showed up, God was there, God was with us today, but there was no holiness or no result in confession or awareness of, of your brokenness. If that hasn't happened, it has to call into question whether you had experienced Yahweh, God, the great I Am. Right? Because when He reveals Himself in that way, there is an awareness of His presence that is that results in this awe and reverence for Him. The Bible talks about that, this fear of the Lord. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, um, Right. Let's, um, man, we, we, we still have several here. Let me just give them to you really quick, and we'll just, I'm not going to spend any time on them, just to kind of finish out the list. Uh, anointed and Christ-centered preaching. Anointed, same word, uh, similar to uh, this one that I've already given you. Anointed and Christ-centered preaching. Preaching. Critical to revival. Supernatural manifestations. Uh, the reference for this one is uh, Acts 2, 14 and 22. Just look that up. Uh, supernatural manifestations. We have just one or two more. Supernatural manifestations. Signs and wonders. The reference for that is 2, 3. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves and they rested on each one of them. So super, it's supernatural, right? Is is um, is part of the point there? Signs and wonders, uh, and then verse uh, thirty-seven: terrifying conviction and divine magnetism. Um, I think this was six and seven. Terrifying. <laughs> it's an interesting choice of words. <laughs> conviction. And I remember, I'll give you this one really quick, that I talk about experiencing God's presence. I was, it was an Easter Sunday, and there were scenes of the passion of Christ, and then the preaching of the Word, and worship, and considering the resurrection. And there was just this awareness of God's presence that resulted in just like, all, like a shaking, like, yeah, like a, this, a trembling before God over His presence and His holiness and what He's done and His love that was poured out and then our response to that divine magnetism and divine... Let's look at that reference really quick and see what we mean by that. Verse uh, 37... Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the disciples, Brethren, what shall we do? So they heard the preaching of the word, God's presence, supernatural, initiated by the Spirit. They're aware of their sin, convicted, divine magnetism, drawn to God. What must we do? Right? <clears throat> Repent and believe. Well, let's close there. Let's pray again. Father God, we thank you for your incredible work, Lord, in creation, in salvation. 
in changing us. And God, we just praise you, Lord. Lord, we do want to experience your presence <coughs> and um, revival, refreshing, renewing. God, I pray that uh, everyone here, Lord, would experience you in this way. And even beyond these walls, God, that we would carry this with us as we go out share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Good to have you with us. I've been out already.